Our next speaker is Margot Wallström. Uh, she is the Director for Diversity and Tolerance at the Swedish Postcode Lottery, a, a women's rights advocate. And uh, since two, 2007, Margot has held the position as Chair of the Council of Women World Leaders Ministerial Initiative, where she has advocated for an increase in the number of women in positions of responsibility. She has also co-founded the European Union Institutional Group of Women, where she has actively promoted gender balance in the European Union. Now, previously, Margot has had an extensive career in politics, during which time she was appointed Deputy Minister of Civil Affairs, where she was responsible for matters concerning women, youth, and consumers. And she had also held a position as Minister of Culture and Minister of Health and Social Affairs. On retiring from her political career, Margot was chosen to become Executive Vice President of the NGO Worldview Global Media, and was later appointed to the European Commission where she actively promoted the participation of women in issues regarding peace and security. Thank you so much. Welcome, Margot Wallström. Thank you very much, dear friends. I'm particularly pleased to have met the future Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, thank you very much and congratulations to your speech. Um, for more than two years, I held a post as a special representative of the UN uh, on conflict-related sexual violence. It left me with a heavier heart, but uh, paradoxically also with more of hope for the future. And I will explain why. I'm of course happy that we started off with referring to what goes on at the moment in Nigeria, because we cannot talk about a girl effect without uh, our thoughts going to these girls. And I was thinking, maybe there is something practical we could do. Uh, I think there are a lot of wealthy people here in, in Norway and in, maybe in this conference as well. So what if we decided to raise uh, the equal number of these girls? What are they, 239 missing? So what if we decided to mobilize 239 uh, people here who would be willing to finance the schooling of one girl? it is not too expensive. You know, it's a small amount every month, but that could be our very practical response to what is happening and um, something that hopefully will change the lives of, of these girls. Um, I was also thinking that uh, um, I would give you one of, of my stories as, as well, because uh, when I started this work, uh, I had to understand that this crime that has been called uh, maybe the oldest, the least visible, and the least punished of all war crimes um, is a global scourge um, to today. And we uh, had to face the challenges of um, addressing three misconceptions or myths about uh, uh, sexual violence. First, that it is inevitable, because it is there, it is reported, even in the Bible, where women is uh, looked at as war booty. Uh, it is in the Iliad, it's uh, in, in the records of, of all wars and conflicts through history. So the first myth is that, that it would be inevitable because of this, or that people refer to it as being so complex that it is almost impossible to deal with. No, it's not. It's a war crime and we have to root it out and we have to decide that we, we can and must root it out. The second myth or misconception about this is that it is unspeakable. And that, of course, because it has to do with uh, some, something sexual. And very often I even heard ambassadors in the UN saying to me, well, you know, this is a very private thing. We don't talk about sex. Um, and we had to start to explain that this is, has rather little with sex to do. This is aggression, this is power and control and dominance, and it is unfortunately a very cheap and silent and effective weapon of modern wars and conflicts. So we have to 
make sure that we talk about it, that we make it visible, that we address it uh, properly. And the third misconception is that it is a lesser crime. Uh, it is not a cultural thing, as you know, as, as I said, it's criminal, but we've had it also in the, in the middle of Europe, in the, in the war in the Balkans, um, and they think that as many as 50,000 women might have been raped during the, the war um, in the Balkans. And in one of these um, trials, uh, uh, Serbian soldiers were accused of, of rape and they looked very surprised that this was one of the charges. And they said, um, as if it was a defense, but we could have killed them. S but the women and the victims, of course, do not see it that way. They said, they took my life without killing me. And this is also the, the problem with conflict-related sexual violence, that it has effects not only on the individual, not only on the woman and, and girl, because in most cases, the victims and survivors are women and girls, but it also has an effect on the family, on the social fabric in a whole society, and on the future of, of a country and of our world. And that is why this issue belongs on top of the agenda of the Security Council. We have placed it there and we had better keep it there to make sure that there is ownership of this issue and responsibility uh, taken uh, by all, um, not only women, uh, but also the, the decision makers and those in power. But when I started my, my uh, job, I, I wanted to put it in a, in a frame and understand also what is the a global context of, of this whole issue. And I started to look at the <clears throat> political ambitions and I read, of course, the UN's Beijing Platform for Action. And this is almost poetry. Today's girls are tomorrow's women. Girls, talents, ideas, and energy determines if we will ever reach our goals on equality, development, and peace. And for a young girl to reach her full potential, she needs to grow and develop in a uh, context or in an environment that gives her possibilities, looks after her, her spiritual, intellectual, and material uh, needs uh, of survival, protection, and development, and respects her rights. And then I found this picture on, as you can see, this is a, a picture from the UN. Um, and Maybe Faisal here is the kindest man in Afghanistan. He might very well be. He will treat Ghulam at his side and who is 10 years old and his new wife, he might treat her as the, the, the precious flower that, that she is. But to be perfectly honest and looking at the statistics, that is more of a coincidence than a real uh, chance for Gulam, and I think that the look that she gives him is um, telling enough. And of course, if you really look at the, the very sad uh, list of facts on how girls are treated worldwide, uh, it's a very long list. And I will only give you uh, a sort of a, a short version and also say something about the positive news because this is as, as important and to return to the fact that also my job left me with more hope finally because I do believe after all of this and my experience is that women are attacked also because they are strong, not weak. They carry, they carry children, they carry water, they carry firewood, they carry responsibility, they carry products to the market, but they should not have to carry the shame of being uh, raped and violated. And that is unfortunately the truth until now, that um, the, the shame and the stigma falls on the victim, not the perpetrator. But um, look at how this goes on around the world today. It starts with selective abortion because uh, the estimate is that there would be between 60 and 100 more million women 
uh, in the statistics, uh, population statistics in South, South Asia, China, North Africa, and Middle East. Uh, if they were not aborted, if girl, uh, girls were not aborted or not registered, because very often it's the man um, uh, who actually register a birth. And then, of course, we have uh, female genital mutilation. And according to UNICEF, between 70 uh, and 140 million girls and women have been, um, have been uh, subject to FGM. And this means, of course, very long, um, uh, th this means lifelong suffering, to, to uh, say it short. And then, uh, much worse health, health situation, because um, uh, the, the proportion of malnourished girls um, is much bigger than the, the uh, proportion of malnourished boys. And much more common that the boys are vaccinated and have access to health care. Uh, and it means also that many more uh, girls die uh, as children. Uh, to work at home, as we've heard already, uh, girls have to do homework, to, to do work at home, in the home, while the boys have an education and they can do, they can play and they can uh, do their, their, their homework from school. And very often uh, we could also meet in some villages uh, girls that didn't know what it was to play. They have never been given time to, to play. And you've already heard all the arguments about um, education for, for girls. Ma many more girls uh, work also in, in the homes globally. Um, in, very often they go abroad, as they did, for example, from Sri Lanka when we lived there. And um, men, there are more girls under 16 years of, of age in this sector than in any other sector uh, of, of work. And they think now the UN believes that there are more than 30,000 uh, girls that are getting married um, every day, and many of them as early as uh, being 10 years uh, of age. This is, though, something that can and must be stopped and where we can see a positive development uh, in many countries, although there are also setbacks, uh, reports recently, that uh, legislation had, had been changed in, in one country to allow for, for girl marriages. Look at also if there is legislation in our countries, in, uh, in our part of the world, because even in Sweden we've had a legislation that actually allowed uh, for exemption um, and uh, there have been 15 such uh, exemptions given over a number of years. But these loopholes in our own national legislation is now being closed and I hope that this is not the case in in uh, Norway that you have such exemptions. And then comes all of the other um, statistics and facts about the lives of, of, of girls, g women and girls in, in war and conflict. Um, and I have also met in Uganda um, a, a girl that was now in her 20s but had been abduct abducted by the LRA together with her brother. And the, maybe the most scary thing with uh, this whole problem of, of conflict-related sexual violence is that it changes every day, a situation of everyday life with all its banalities and, and, and um, the, the things that you carry out and do every day, that it has changed that into hell. And this time the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army, came and took this girl and her brother, uh, brought them out into the jungle and uh, she was... Uh, um, she was uh, gang raped and then they told her, well, now your brother has witnessed all of this, so you had better kill him. So she had to kill her own brother uh, as the start of her 10 year uh, life with the LRA. And she also gave birth to several children. And I met her when she had been taken out of the, the jungle, luckily by some wise older women that knew how to try to repair and, uh, her life and to help her into an ordinary life. Um, and the strength of exactly these women is also what gives uh, hope for, for the future. This is not impossible. It's a matter of um, leadership. It's a matter of making sure that the UN and all of us 
uh, decide that it is um, a global scourge that must be and can be rooted out. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer to any questions you might have later. Thank you.